Hello, I'm Kendra Winchester and welcome back to my channel. And today we're going to be talking about Mrs. Dalloway. So actually, maybe welcome to my channel because you've never been here before uh, because this is uh, a read-along that we're doing all across the booktornet. So you might be coming from Instagram or Twitter or just Goodreads. Uh, welcome. Welcome to Booktube. Uh, it's a great place here. You'll definitely want to check it out. I, I really enjoy it. I mean, obviously. So Mrs. Dalloway is my favorite novel of Virginia's. So these are the editions of Mrs. Dalloway that I own. This is my display copy, um, my non-markup copy. Though someone was actually editing Virginia in this one. I bought it used, so that's strange. And then this is my markup copy, and this is my reader, which I only mark in pencil for whatever reason. Um, but I've been reading some essays from this and prep for this, so we're gonna look at those in a second. But I really love Mrs. Dalloway, and it's just a beautiful novel, and it's definitely just my favorite. It's not her best novel. Probably The Waves would probably, people would say, would be her best novel, but I feel like this is my favorite. I also think it's very accessible if you're beginning with Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf has this very stream of consciousness style that was coming up at the time during modernism, and this is the first novel where I think her style reaches its maturity, her first master for a novel that really established her place in the literary canon and why she's so loved. This is just, I think, the real start of her career. So we're going to talk about that today. Now for some background for Virginia, I'm going to recommend that you go check out this video I made on Virginia Woolf and her different works and her background different things. It's like 15 minutes long and that's just a lot to add to this video. Uh, so I'm just going to recommend that. In fact, I'm going to list it as the first video in this read-along playlist. It'll also give you some background information. So feel free to stop the video, go watch that one, come back, and then you might be a little more in the know of what's going on with the themes in this book. Just for those of you just arriving and here and just want to know a little bit about her, uh, she was born in 1882 and she grew up obviously in late Victorian era and started publishing in the late teens after she married her husband Leonard Wolfe and they had a publishing house together. Virginia Woolf suffered from mental health issues her entire life and some physical issues as well. And she was hospitalized several times. Eventually, though, she died in 1941 from committing suicide. Uh, so it's a very tragic story, but she was just an amazing mind and an amazing author. And so I thought a good place to start with this would be this novel because it carries a lot of her primary themes throughout, through all of her work are in this book in one novel, which I think is just absolutely fantastic. So when I was prepping for this read-along, I was reading some essays from my Mrs. Dalloway reader, and I realized a lot of them were like, I hated Mrs. Dalloway when I first read it, but I guess it's redeemable because of these qualities or, um, yeah, Mrs. Dalloway is vapid and pointless, but Septimus makes her, you know, kind of redeems her. Or, or I'll see other videos on a bit Virginia Woolf and they'll be like, Mrs. Dalloway is a weak novel, like there's no point, like she's such a vapid character. And I just didn't understand why people didn't like Mrs. Dalloway because reasons. So I was really wondering about this and I found an essay in here though that really spoke to those other essays um, and why um, Virginia wrote about Mrs. Dalloway. So it says here in this essay by Daniel Mendelssohn, um, it says that Clarissa, quote, Clarissa's life is meant indeed to be one of those existences, neither brilliant nor tragic, that moved Virginia Woolf in a room of one's own to ponder what the proper subject and style of an authentic women's literature might possibly be. The values of novels, she argued, reflect the values of life, which novels must mirror, and in was it, it was furthermore obvious that, quote, the values of women differ very often from the values which have been made by the other sex. Naturally, this is so. Yet it's the masculine values that prevail. Speaking crudely, football and sport are important. The worship of fashion and buying of clothes, trivial. And these values are inevitably transferred from life to fiction. This is an important book, the critic assumes, because it deals with war. This is an ins insignificant book because it deals with feelings of women in a drawing room. A scene in a battlefield is more important than a scene in a shop. Everywhere, and much more subtly, the difference of value persists. And so that is what Virginia Woolf tackles in this very novel. She tackles the idea of what we value as important. In fact, when a lot of people read Mrs. Dalloway, they view Septimus as the stronger portion of the novel because Mrs. Dalloway is so unimportant. 
So what we're going to do in this particular read-along is we're going to focus on Mrs. Dalloway herself and on her life and her relationship, specifically her relationships. This novel is about Clarissa Dalloway and the day that she's preparing for her party. The entire novel is set in a single day and she is preparing for that and she is contrasted with uh, Septimus. In the introduction to the 1928 edition of Mrs. Dalloway, she says that Septimus is her double, uh, of Mrs. Dalloway's double, that she and Septimus are expressions of almost the same essence, that they are to contrast each other and illustrate uh, the same thing in just two different forms, basically. But I wanted to focus on the relationships because there are so many different readings of this book, and I'm sorry if I missed something that you love about this book, uh, but uh, this video could be like hours long, uh, but we don't have that much time. So today we're going to end at page 48 in my edition. Um, this is the main edition in the United States. It's the same as this edition, um, just different covers. This edition, the vintage edition uh, that I have, vintage classic edition, there we go, ends on page 47 and then the regular vintage edition which I think a lot of you guys have in the UK ends on page 52. What I'm going to do at the end of this video is show you where the next end of 50 pages is ending so you'll have a general idea but it is roughly another 50 pages or so. There are no chapters in this book so <laughs> we're just gonna have to wing it here right? <laughs> so let's get started into the book. So I'm gonna have my copy down here. I'm gonna call out page numbers. Again it's this edition um, from Harcourt. All right Famous first line, Mrs. Dalloway said she would buy the flowers herself. For Lucy had her work cut out for her. The doors were taken off their hinges. Rumpelmeyer's men were coming, and then thought Clarissa Dalloway, what a, what a morning, fresh as if issued to children on a beach. This really gives you that image, this veneer that we're gonna slowly uh, go beneath of Clarissa and the idea that she is this vapid woman that everyone talks about so much. And uh, this gives you that impression, but note the next line. It says, what a lark, what a plunge. And she is going forth out into the world. You'll notice that when she refers to her house or rooms, particular rooms in her house, she often uses uh, imagery of a cloister of nuns or a tower or something. And the idea that she is trapped and secluded, isolated in her house, by venturing forth into London, she is freeing herself. And this begins her mental journey. There is no real plot to this book. The plot itself is the wrangling of Clarissa in her own consciousness and trying to come to terms with things. It is about her intellect and her mind. And, and that's what might be a bit daunting about this book, but I, I find it obviously quite fascinating. Immediately, of course, on page three, we see that she goes in her stream of consciousness style, style and we get a flashback into Borton, which is when where uh, she grew up in her youth, and we meet Peter Walsh. Uh, we know that she's a close friend of his. She describes him and how he's grumpy, and uh, he has this pocket knife, which we'll talk about again later, and uh, how strange it was that she remembered it. And then we go back forth uh, to London. There's this beautiful section about London here throughout this first like 25, 30 pages. I would love to talk about, but we just don't have the time. Uh, but as I said, it's set in the same day, and you can actually mark the time by clocks clocks around the book mark the hour and half hour markers. In this case, we have Bing, Big Ben strikes there out it boomed in this beautiful section of her style. Just gorgeous. There's just nothing like it. So we see her moving about on a beautiful June day, preparing for her party. Uh, we're introduced to her and her character and her relation, and you can see that she'll be going along and thinking about things on the street, but then she'll have these flashbacks to her past. And one of them is thinking about Peter again. And she says that she did not marry him and she was right not to marry him. And she says, quote, on page eight, she had to break it with him or they would have been destroyed. Both of them ruined, she was convinced. And she goes on in that paragraph to talk about why it wouldn't have worked and how the things that he said to her, that she was cold and heartless and a prude. And, and she says, quote, and she wasted her pity for he was quite happy. He assured her perfectly happy, though he had never done a thing that they talked of. His whole life had been a failure. It made her angry still. She's remembering him and she's becoming very angry at that one inst that the instance where they had their huge fight and she said she would not marry him and the relationship was never the same and now she feels justified. This begins this back and forth really, I think, of her 
trying to figure out if she made the right decision. Throughout the entire book, she is questioning on her choice of marrying her husband, Richard Dalloway. Was she right in doing that? Should she have married Richard Dalloway? Would her life be different? And the reason I wanted to mention the parallel between Septimus and Mrs. Dalloway so early is because this is part of her parallel with Septimus. She's at the point in her life where she's struggling to feel emotion for life. She says later on in the book, no, the words meant absolutely nothing to her now. She could not even get an echo of her old emotion. We see these notes where she's struggling to have this passion for life. She is busy distracting herself by performing the socialite woman that she feels like she's supposed to, but in reality she's not happy. She's not feeling the passion that she once did in her youth. A great point in this book, I think, is when she's walking down Bond Street, and it starts on page 10, at the bottom of page 10. She says, she had the oddest sense of being herself invisible, unseen, unknown, there being no more marrying, no more having children now, but only this astonishing and rather solemn progress with the rest of them up Bond Street, this being Mrs. Dalloway, not even Clarissa anymore, this being Mrs. Richard Dalloway. You see there the progression of her thoughts about being invisible because she's a middle-aged woman. She's no longer doing what women in society are supposed to do. She's done, she's married, she has kids. Society says that's all that women are expected of them. And what's left for her? So she feels like she's not even Clarissa anymore. She's just Mrs. Richard Dalloway. The only way she exists in society is in relation to her husband. She moves from there and we get another beautiful section um, of her on the street. Uh, there's flowers and there's a lot of imagery with her friend Sally and flowers so you can actually note that throughout the book. Um, but we're also introduced to Septimus and we're not going to talk about Septimus Warren Smith very much today. We're going to talk about him in next week's because we get a better section of idea of who he is. But just note there's a lot of imagery of death in this. We see Mrs. Dalloway pondering death on page 13 where she's imagining herself joining the cosmos um, but then you have a more realistic view of death and Septimus and his suicidal thoughts. And his wife notes that that's a very cowardly thing, but he's been a soldier. He's brave. He is manly. The doctors say, well, he can't be this way. Uh, he's not cowardly. He's brave. So there's nothing wrong with him. He just needs to take a walk. But his wife knows there's something wrong with him and she feels an endless frustration. So we're going to come back to Septimus next week. So stay tuned. Keep an eye out as you're reading. We're going to jump forward um, to when she gets back to her house. Uh, Mrs. Dalloway eventually uh, goes through London and she comes back to her house and she uh, enters her house and she says, like a nun withdrawing or a child exploring a tower, she went upstairs, paused at the window, came to the bathroom. There was green linoleum and a tap dripping. There was an emptiness about the heart of life, an attic room. I feel like this really hits home the idea that she feels empty, that this attic room, its emptiness, its isolation is a representative of how she feels about life. And you see uh, death further down the page, for the house sat so long that Richard insisted after her illness that she must sleep undisturbed. And so she slept um, in the room. It says, so the room was an attic, the bed narrow, and lying there reading, she slept badly and could not dispel a virginity preserved through childbirth, which clung to her like a sheet. And it's this idea she mentions as a child exploring a tower. There was this idea in Victorian women, the angel of the house, a sexless, passionless, like minor. She was essentially a child to be taken care of. She uses that imagery throughout this section to emulate the whole angel of the house. And in another essay, Virginia Woolf says that we need to kill the angel of the house so that women can be full human beings. They are not these things to be put on pedestals. They are real people. And we also learn that she and Richard's relationship is essentially passionless. Um, she says, in quote, she could see what she lacked. It was not beauty. It was not mind. It was something central which permeated. Something warm which broke up surfaces and rippled the cold contact of man and woman or of women together. For that she could dimly perceive. She resented it, had a scruple picked up heaven knows where, or as she felt, sent by nature, who is invariably wise. Yet she could not resist something yielding to the charm of woman. And so we see this transition here, and we see introduction to Sally Seaton, who is the second uh, relationship that we're going to focus on in our read-along here. Down the page, on page 32, it says, But this question of love, she thought, putting her coat away, is falling in love with women. Take Sally Seton, her relation in the old days with Sally Seton. Had not that, after all, been love? 
That is one of my favorite lines in the entire book, where she asks herself, had not that, after all, been love? In her quest for love and passion and trying to remember what it was like to feel the wide range of emotions, I think that she is looking back and realizing so much about her life that she may have missed or that the consequences of the choices that she's made in her life. And she thinks about Sally. And she and Sally become fast friends. They like are, in, it's an intellectual, romantic kind of relationship. And they have a meeting of the minds. At the time, Francine Prote's notes in the introduction to the Mrs. Dalloway Reader, she says that Virginia met Vita Sackville West, who was one of Virginia Woolf's great loves of her life, during this time when she was writing Mrs. Dalloway. And they had a great meeting of the minds. And their love was a very romantic, very intellectual type love. And that is the type of love that we see um, in this book. She says that her relationship, her feelings for Sally had a purity and integrity. And then that's, this is when we see the quote where she says that no word, no, the words meant absolutely nothing to her now. She could not even get an echo of her old emotion. So even though she had this passion with Sally in the past, this great love that she had, she no longer feels that. Now, something that I miss this, the, all the previous times I've read this book, uh, something that I realized this time was this quote she has about Shakespeare. Now, at the time Virginia was writing this, she was reading philosophy and Shakespeare and the modern voices of the time. Um, so there's a lot of Shakespeare and just allusions to other works in this book. But this one is beautiful. Clarissa is going downstairs to meet Sally for dinner uh, back when they were 18. And it says, and going downstairs and feeling as she crossed the hall, quote, if it were now to die, it were now to be most happy, end quote. That was her feeling, Othello's feeling, and she felt it. She was convinced, as strongly as Shakespeare meant Othello to feel it, all because she was coming down to dinner in a white frock to meet Sally Seton. And if we had any question about the feelings of her young love, um, there's a very important section at the end of page 35. And it says, then came the most exquisite moment of her life, passing a stone with her own flowers in it. Sally stopped, picked a flower, kissed her on the lips, the whole world might have turned upside down. The others disappeared. There she was alone with Sally. And she felt that she had been given a present, wrapped up and told to keep it, not to look at it, a diamond, something infinitely precious. She says this moment with Sally was the radiance burnt through, the revelation, the religious feeling. And then Peter appears. And she says, she quote, felt the hostility, his jealousy, his determination to break into their companionship. Now. Now, Clarissa loves Peter, but it is more of a platonic, nurturing love. But Peter is romantically in love with Clarissa. She is the great love of his life, and he is very demanding. In the past, I haven't really liked Peter, to be perfectly honest. I still don't, am not his biggest fan. Uh, but this time around, with the whole idea that Septimus and uh, Clarissa are parallels of each other, we see that she struggles to feel emotion while Peter has an overabundance of emotion. He truly loves Clarissa and he's made a mess of his life because he can't get his stuff together because he loves her so much and he's upset that he didn't get what he wanted. He is still a very much a masculine, traditionally patriarchal male who views women as something to be owned. There is a long history of men disliking female friendship, the whole idea that we are competing against other women, you know, that kind of thing. And so when he sees Sally and Clarissa together, he knows they have something special and he is very angry about it. In fact, just like he intruded on Sally and Clarissa back when they were younger, in the present, Clarissa is now in her, uh, I think like some sort of study, she's mending a dress. And we see this moment on page 40 where he says, Mrs. Dalloway will see me, said the elderly man in the hall. Oh yes, she will see me, he repeated, putting Lucy aside very benevolently. And running upstairs ever so quickly, yes, 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 he muttered as he ran upstairs. She will see me. After five years in India, Clarissa will see me. And, as the, and he goes intruding on her uh, little sanctum and she like clutches the, you know, the dress to herself and um, immediately we see, quote, putting his hand into his pocket, he took out a large pocket knife and half opened the blade. This is a very thinly veiled sexual reference um, to his penis and there's an obsession there with his knife. And so we can see obsession with his own sexuality there and his lust for women. Uh, there's a moment later in the book where he follows a, a random stranger woman down the street and is touching his knife. And it's just like, oh. And so he does that throughout the entire thing. And 
when Peter is mentioned, oftentimes the women, both Sally and Clarissa, mention his knife and his obsession with touching his knife continuously. Uh, it's this, it gives me the creeps, quite frankly, uh, but we see that throughout this entire scene. Clarissa is filled with a rush of feeling and tenderness for Peter, but Peter is still very much in love with Clarissa, yet angry that she chose Richard over him, and he does not understand why, because he deserves Clarissa, and he genuinely cares for her, but he still feels entitled, in a sense. So. Uh, he is, you know, he's touching his knife continuously throughout the scene. We also see Clarissa uh, messing with her uh, sewing kit and different things. So there's just a lot of shallowly veiled imagery here. I think honestly that Virginia Woolf was, was playing around with this because at the time she was reading people like James Joyce and D.H. Lawrence. You know, Catherine Mansfield said that D.H. Lawrence could see sex in the grass. He saw sex in everything and it was really obnoxious and I think that Virginia Woolf was really tired of that. She really emulated a lot of Ulysses in this book because she really hated Ulysses and James Joyce in general. So she wanted to take him to task. And so you have the mistress and master of stream of consciousness going like face-to-face -face battle with these novels set in a single day in June, very close apart, and it's just great. My advisor in grad school was, a, he did a dissertation on Joyce and I love Virginia Woolf. And so we would both go back and forth because it's basically a long, standing uh, rivalry there. So anyway, and we even see a line where it says, so Peter Walsh and Clarissa sitting side by side on the sofa challenge each other. And we can see that he is still in love with her throughout this entire scene and he actually breaks down crying and we see this, again, this over emotion, this overabundance of emotion that he has and how Clarissa really disdains him for that, that he has the sentimentality. But there is an irony here because both Sally and Clarissa frequently mention that Peter kept calling them sentimental because they're women. But in reality, he's the one with the overabundance of emotion there. He is the sentimental one. And she says his silly unconventionality, his weakness. And she really disliked him for that. But yet there's still, whatever reason, a feeling of love. And uh, his life is kind of a mess. He married someone on a boat going over to India, and now he wants to divorce her for uh, an Indian woman that he met over uh, over there. And uh, it's just, it's, it is a mess. So. She feels guilty for him, so at the very end here, we see him saying, Peter, Peter, remember my party tonight. And he calls, she calls after him, and he goes off into the street. And that is the end of the section that we're going to talk about. You know, I think you can see all of these different relationships being set up in this first 50 pages. We see this, like, weird love shape between Peter, Sally, Clarissa, and Richard Dalloway. We see this possible, three possible futures for Clarissa. We know the ones that she's chosen, but now she is contemplating her past and the feelings and having to confront her own choice of marrying Mr. Dalloway. And does she actually want to marry Mrs. Mr. Dalloway? And I really appreciate that. So beneath the veneer of this woman, performing a, a traditional society woman in the 1920s, we have a woman really seriously pondering her existence and the, you know, where, how she got to where she is. Now, I will say that, you know, you have these beautiful sections uh, about London, but it's almost like she's torn. It's like she's trying to stay in the mindset that I am the society woman, but when she's not paying attention, her mind wanders back to her past and, and Borton and, and the experience that she had there in the moment where she said she would not marry Peter. And so everything goes back to that summer. And so if she doesn't, isn't careful, she will keep thinking about these things in her life and realizing her own unhappiness. And so I think when we see that, we see all of these different things and the love and the passion that she used to feel and this lack of emotion that she now feels. So we're going to go move forward. Um, and next week we will be at page one around, there isn't a break here. So we're going to be around 106, 108. Um, and this is a moment where it says they all smiled, Peter Walsh and Mrs. Mr. Dalloway was genuinely glad. If you want a photo of the text, I can send that to you if you're looking for it. But just know that we're going to be at the luncheon where, um, I believe the luncheon where Richard Dalloway and, um, his female friend is. I don't think it's that kind of female friend, but anyway, so that's where we're going to mail. That Peter Walsh had been in love with Clarissa. There's another line. Everyone knows that. He's still in love with her.
So that is the first uh, episode of this read-along. I hope you enjoyed that. I, I did spend a lot, of a lot of time reading the text, but I think it's important to set up the novel and uh, illustrate the turmoil that I think Clarissa is feeling and the inner battle, because that is basically, as I said, the only plot that is actually of this novel. So is her own view of herself and acceptance or rejection of what she has chosen. So will she accept her life? Will she live in forever turmoil? We don't know. So anyway, thank you so much for watching this. And uh, I will link uh, the discussion group for this, the Goodreads discussion group down in the description box. Again, the Virginia Woolf video um, is also down there. Just check all, check down there. Everything's there. <laughs> well, thank you for watching. And I guess I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.